standing between text and image, Gekiga is a new information medium. It originated as one branch of multi-panel manga, growing while absorbing only the strong points of surrounding media, and has gained such gigantic power as to change Japanese publishing and image culture. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. So the opening quote is from a special section of a 1969 issue of Weekly Shonen Manga dedicated to the rise of Gekiga, a movement often considered the birth of alternative manga in Japan. I think the quote is pretty true in that it changed Japanese publishing and image culture. Maybe a bit overwrought in that I'm not sure it's like the most powerful thing ever. I mentioned Gekiga when discussing Tezuka, but we're going to talk about it in detail today, which means that we need to take a few steps back. While Gekiga isn't necessarily gendered, the overwhelming majority of its practitioners were men. And as such, just like the Year 24 group was responding to shoujo manga that they were reading, the artists associated with Gekiga were responding to the manga that they were reading. And that was mostly shonen manga, and it was largely aimed at children. You see, Gekiga got its start in the 1950s. And while manga didn't have to be for kids, publishers were still mostly focused on children, but the artists who started the movement had read things like Tezuka's Shin Takarajima as kids and teens in 1947, and, well, it was 10 years later, they were young adults. They wanted stories that they felt reflected their reality, not just their fantasy worlds. And so, Gekiga. The term itself was coined by the artist Yoshihiro Tatsumi around 1957. As opposed to manga, which translates as whimsical or carefree pictures, Gekiga means dramatic pictures. Gekiga artists explicitly targeted adult audiences, and their stories were often dark and violent. Gekiga featured urban, gritty settings and real-life drama, but Gekiga also encouraged an aesthetic shift. Gekiga artists were interested in replicating cinematic techniques on the page. They didn't just want to get the story out as efficiently as possible, they wanted to focus on paneling and layout that reflected a character's interior life, their settings' details, and their experience of time. Interestingly, Gekiga also reflected a return to contemporary manga's roots. Tezuka started as a creator for rental bookstores, Kashihonya, in Osaka. But with his immense success, he and others like him moved to major publishing houses in Tokyo. Now, Gekiga artists were allowed more leeway to experiment with their art in rental books, and thus, most of them got their start in Osaka Kashihonya. In 1959, Tatsumi, who I've mentioned, Masahiko Matsumoto, and Takao Saito, as well as five other artists, formed a group called Gekiga Kobo and wrote a Gekiga Manifesto, which they sent to magazines and newspapers. And this was the unofficial official founding of Gekiga as a movement. The group didn't really last long in any official capacity, but the influence of Gekiga and its manifesto would continue far into the future. For one thing, many of the elements of Gekiga, especially its visual elements, would be folded into mainstream shonen manga. Manga publishing in general began to pitch to a wider range of audiences and ages, not just kids and teenagers. For example, two major texts deeply influenced by Gekiga, sometimes even just considered Gekiga texts, Goseki Kojima and Kazuo Koike's Lone Wolf and Cub, and Takao Saito's Golgo 13 were both published in relatively mainstream comics magazines. Lone Wolf in weekly action manga from 1970 to 1976, and Golgo 13 in big comics from 1968 to the present. Yes, the present. It's a very long-running series. While both magazines are geared toward slightly older audiences, neither are what we would call alternative manga, or running in what we would call alternative manga journals. Shigeru Mizuki is another fascinating crossover figure. His early work, like Gegege no Kitaro, was a popular mainstream shonen series. However, he was also involved in Gekiga and published more personal works like Nomba, a graphic novel about his grandmother, or Onward Toward Our Noble Deaths, a scathing memoir about his time in the Japanese military. His popular early series, combined with his later more thoughtful alternative works, made him a household name in Japan. Now, while elements of Gekiga were absorbed into the mainstream, some artists continued to experiment in new ways. And therefore, many of the artists involved in the Gekiga movement would go on to be involved in the continued growth of alternative manga in Japan. 
and perhaps the most important source of this experimentation was the journal Garo, founded by Shirato Sampei and Katsuichi Nagai in 1964. Unfortunately for most of us, very little of the work published in Garo has been translated into English. So what I'll try to do here is give you an idea of some of the artists and some of the movements in the worlds of alternative manga, just so you can get a taste of what's happening outside of mainstream manga publishing. The first major figure to rise from Garo was Yoshiharu Tsuge. While his early work is sort of gritty gekiga, his later work, including what's probably his most famous piece, Nejishiki or Screw Style, relies much more heavily on dream imagery and surrealism. Shinichi Abe began to publish deeply personal stories, often about his conflicted romantic relationships, like Shinjuku Ophthalmologist. In the late 1970s, Abe was diagnosed with schizophrenia and retired from public life, eventually returning to comics in the 1990s. Both Tsuge and Abe were pioneers of what was called the watakushi genre, a subjective first-person genre that explored thoughts, anxieties, feelings, and fears of its creators. Watakushi manga was popular throughout the 60s and 70s, but by the late 70s it had passed out of vogue. In the 1980s, alternative manga was dominated by heta uma, sort of literally translating as bad good. Heta uma is purposely de-skilled drawing in which artists like Takashi Nemoto, King Terry, and Yoshikazu Ebisu embrace ugliness, a childlike drawing style, and even offensive imagery as a way to evoke visceral emotions and reactions. Speaking of offensive imagery, the 80s also saw manga embrace eroguro, short for erotic grotesque, inspired by older literary genres. Eroguro manga is a strange hybrid of pretty shoujo aesthetics with horror imagery. Perhaps its best known practitioner, especially in the West, is Suehiro Maruo. Women artists of the 1980s provided interesting counterpoints to both Heta Uma and Eroguro. For example, Hinako Sugiura used ukiyo-e imagery to create manga explicitly reclaiming the language of traditional Japanese art. And Michio Matsumoto drew from watakushi themes to create something slightly different, this brutally honest slice-of-life manga about women's experiences in contemporary Japanese society. By the 1990s, Garo was still in publication but suffering really low sales, and ultimately unable to pay its artists. By 1996, the founding editor Kitsuichi Nagai had passed, and Garo closed its doors. Its legacy was continued by the anthology series AX, which was founded in 1998 by several of the staff members from Garo. In the intervening years, Heta Uma has remained pretty popular, as has Slice of Life stories. One relatively interesting new genre that is kind of a, an offshoot of Eroguro, which still exists, is Abuna Kawaii, and it literally means dangerous cute, dangerously cute. Abuna Kawaii artists like Junko Mizuno trade the more beautiful shoujo manga imagery for cutesy Hello Kitty style imagery, but maintain that explicit violence and sexuality to create some very funny and disturbing cognitive dissonance for the readers. Now, the 1990s was also a time of a general huge economic downturn for Japan, which had become throughout the 70s and 80s a major economic power. Now, in response to this lack of economic power, Japan began to work toward establishing what's called soft power or cultural influence. And thus, the spread of Japanese media and pop culture is part of a purposeful strategy to gain influence on the global stage. And the spread of manga and anime worldwide in the 90s and 2000s is absolutely a part of this strategy. However, as I've mentioned, most of what's translated and shared in is mainstream popular culture, not the alternative art I've been talking about today. And even for me, who has some access to Japanese language and a decent understanding of politics and culture, Getting a hold of this information, let alone these texts, takes a lot of work and digging. The sharper among you might have noticed I'm ending this about 20 years out of date. Even I only have so much time and resources to chase this information down. That's why it's important not to assume that what we receive from another culture is the full picture of that culture's output. It's only tip of the iceberg stuff. Anyway, that's where we're ending our mini-series on manga for now. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a lot. We'll see you next time.